السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ما بعد I think it was better the other way slightly lower so it doesn't go into the camera shot so much okay so inshallah we're still uh, we're, we're still on the tafsir of surah al-qari'ah and last week we I think we only covered one verse last week, verse number four. Uh, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thus far in our tafsir of this surah, Allah Azza wa Jal has repeated the concept of Al-Qari'ah, which as we said is one of the names of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, Al-Qari'ah, which is translated as a crashing blow <coughs> and refers to the sound <coughs> that will be made at the time of the striking of the Day of Judgment. We mentioned the two opinions amongst the scholars of Tafsir, that Al-Qari'a either is referring to the Day of Judgment itself, or the second opinion was what? That it's referring to? What was the second opinion? Al-Qari'a is either the Day of Judgment, or it's referring to? No, the blowing of the trumpet. The blowing of the trumpet, which occurs just before. And as we said, the difference between the two is small. Then Allah Azza wa Jal, in, in, the, in the verse that we covered last week, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ يَكُونُ النَّاسُ كَالْفَرَاشِ الْمَبْثُوثِ On the day that people will emerge as, uh, what was the translation? Scattered. Scattered locusts. Is that correct? Oh no, moths. On a day when people will be like scattered moths, right? And we mentioned the opinion amongst the scholars of tafsir concerning uh, the other verse of the Qur'an in Surah Al-Qamr, which Allah Azza wa Jal calls them, كَأَنَّهُمْ جَرَادٌ مُنْتَشِرٌ As if they are scattered locusts. And we said that Imam Al-Qurtubi, rahimahullah, amongst others, from amongst the scholars of tafsir, they combine between the locusts and the moths in a number of ways. One of them is that they emerge in terms of their number, like a swarm of moths or locusts, uh, you know, and... and I was reading on the news yesterday, today, a couple of days ago, I don't remember, but there's like a massive swarm of locusts in East Africa, even in parts of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and so on. And if you look at the photos and the pictures of them, that's what the scholars are referring to. The scholars say that this is how people will emerge from their graves on the Day of Judgment in terms of number, in terms of, 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 of quantity, in terms of weakness, because a moth is weak inherently. And when they first emerge, they will be scattered, meaning that they will be in any which and every direction, falling in, on, into one another, jumping over one another, bumping into one another. And then, muhti'ina ila da, a caller will call out. And when they are called, they will become like locusts that travel towards a single goal. So moths are scattered everywhere, and locusts normally go towards food. A plague of locusts is normally focused in its direction of travel. And that is how the scholars combined between the two. And we said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after mentioning Al-Qari'ah, as we know is one of the, na- the names of the days, the day of judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving us two snippets or two snapshots of what will take place on that day. The first is in relation to humankind themselves, people, how they, how they will emerge on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. And the second, which is the verse that will begin with today, verse number five, is the way that the world will change and the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how it will change and transform on that day. So Allah azza wa jalla in verse number five, he says, وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَالْعِهْنِ الْمَنْفُوشِ And the mountains will be like tufts of wool or carded wool in another translation or like wool fluffed up in another third translation. So the, Allah Azza wa Jal is describing the mountains on Yawm Al-Qiyamah that they will be like wool. They will be like wool or tufts of wool. Tufts of wool means what? Not like a ball of wool, but pieces of wool. Right? Pieces of wool. A ball of wool is obviously together and one and can still be pretty strong when it is combined. But tufts of wool meaning that it is scattered all over the place. And this is in the backdrop obviously when you look at this verse, you find other verses in the Qur'an. Some of them speak about mountains, 
and how the mountains will change on that day. But then we have other verses of the Quran that speak generally about how creation will be on that day, how Allah Azza wa will change the creation and the heavens and the earth to a form that we're not familiar with, to a form that will be on that day. So for example, in Surah Al-Takweer, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes this and He says, إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ When the sun is shrouded in darkness, وَإِذَا النُّجُومُ كَدَرَتْ And when the stars are dimmed, وَإِذَا الْجِبَالُ سُيِّرَتْ And when the, mo- when the mountains are set in motion, meaning that they're no longer stable, right? Because one of the things that we know about mountains is that they are firm and stable. وَإِذَا الْعِشَارُ عُطِّلَتْ When pregnant camels are abandoned, وَإِذَا الْوُحُوشُ حُشِرَتْ when wild beasts are herded together, وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ سُجِّرَتْ And when the seas boil over. And then we have a, another similar but also slightly different description in Surah Al-Infitar. In the opening verses, Allah Azza wa says, إِذَا السَّمَاءُ فطرت, When the sky is torn apart, وَإِذَا الْكَوَاكِبُ تَثَرَتْ And when the stars are scattered, وَإِذَا الْبِحَارُ فُجِّرَتْ And when the seas burst forth, وَإِذَا الْقُبُورُ بُعْثِرَتْ And when the graves are turned inside out. And then yet again in Surah Al-Inshiqaq, Allah Azza wa Jal gives us a further description. إِذَا السَّمَاءُ شَقَّتْ When the sky is ripped apart. وَأَذِنَتْ لِرَبِّهَا وَحُقَّتْ Obeying its Lord as it rightly must. وَإِذَا الْأَرْضُ مُدَّتْ And when the earth is leveled out. وَأَلْقَتْ مَا فِيهَا وَتَخَلَّتْ And it casts out its contents and it becomes empty. وَأَذِنَتْ لِرَبِّهَا وَحُقَّتْ Obeying its Lord as it rightly must. And a fourth description found in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, Allah Azza wa says, إِذَا وَقَعَتِ الْوَاقِعَةِ When that which is coming arrives, لَيْسَ لِوَقَعَتِهَا كَاذِبَةً No one will be able to deny its coming. خَافِضَةُ الرَّافِعَةِ It will bring low and it will raise high. إِذَا رُجَّتِ الْأَرْضُ رَجَّةً when the earth is shaken violently, وَبُسَّتِ الْجِبَالُ بَسَّا And the mountains are grounded to powder, فَكَانَتْ هَبَاءً مُنْبَثَّا And turned to scattered dust. Right, in the hadith in At-Tirmidhi and the Muslim of Imam Ahmad, on the authority of Abdullah ibn Umar رضي الله عنهما, that the Prophet said, صلى الله عليه وسلم, whoever wishes to see the day of judgment as if it is before their eyes, then let them read إِذَا الشَّمْسُ كُوِّرَتْ إِذَا السَّمَاءُ فَطَرَتْ إِذَا السَّمَاءُ شَقَّتْ Right, the opening passages of those three surahs. It is as if you see يوم القيامة before your eyes. And that is because Allah Azza wa Jal describes in vivid detail how much the world will change and how things will change on the day of judgment. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he says القَارِعَ which is a word and a term and a phrase that strikes fear and terror into the hearts and it also... Uh, makes us question and want to know more and understand more concerning this day, Allah Azza wa mentions two main things that will take place on that day. The first is how mankind will emerge in their vast quantity and number and the state in which they will emerge. And number two is how the world will change. Now in other parts of the Quran as we've seen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes into more detail. In Surah Al-Qari'ah, Allah Azza wa takes only one aspect and he goes and focuses on that one aspect, and that aspect is, as we've said, the mountains. They will be like tufts of wool. Other verses that also speak about this, Shaykh Muhammad al-Amin al-Shaqiti, rahimahullah ta'ala, in Adwa'u al-Bayan, in his book of Tafsir, he gathers other verses that also speak about the change, or the, 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 what will happen to mountains, the change that will occur to the mountains on Yawm al-Qiyamah. So he mentions, for example, the verse that we mentioned in Surah Al-Waqi'ah, وَبُسَّتِ الْجِبَالُ بَسَّةً And the mountains will be ground to powder. فَكَانَتْ هَبَاءً مُنْبَثَّةً They will be like scattered dust. Right? So the mountains, if we think about them, are known for what? If you were to describe a mountain, you would describe it as being strong, right? And firm, and imposing, and high and big and tall and all of those terms that you associate with mountains and the strength of mountains and the firmness of mountains right and we often use it even in everyday speech he's as strong and as firm as a mountain because a mountain doesn't move and Allah Azza wa Jal when he describes the earth he describes as the mountains as pigs or awasiya 
fiha. They stabilize the earth, they're like pegs that Allah Azza wa has placed upon the earth. Yawmul Qiyamah brings a change to all of that. And that same creation of Allah that we associate with its strength and firmness and power, it will turn into scattered dust. And dust is one of the most you know, like feeble and weakest of elements. That is how it will become on Yawmul Qiyamah. In the other verse in Surah Al-Muzammir, Allah Azza wa Jal says, يَوْمَ تَرْجُفُ الْأَرْضُ وَالْجِبَالُ وَكَانَتِ الْجِبَالُ كَثِيبًا مَهِيلًا On the day when the earth and the mountains will shake, the mountains will become a heap of loose sand. They will become like a heap of loose sand. And Allah Azza wa says uh, in, in Surah Naba, وَسُيِّرَتِ الْجِبَالُ فَكَانَتْ سَرَابًا and the mountains are removed and will be like a mirage. Meaning that you will see them there one moment, and the next moment they are scattered into dust, meaning that they no longer exist. Right? It's like a mirage. And Allah Azza wa says in Surah Al-Naml, وَتَرَى الْجِبَالَ تَحْسَبُهَا جَامِدَةً وَهِيَ تَمُرُّ مَرَّ السَّحَابِ You will see the mountains and think that they are firmly fixed, but they will float away like clouds. They will float away like clouds. And so this is the description that Allah Azza wa gives. All of them revolve around what? That the mountains will no longer be there. The mountains will disappear. So one of the questions is, why does Allah Azza wa on Yawm Al-Qiyamah take away the mountains? Why are mountains no longer there? Could it be like a way of people sort of saying, could it hide behind there? So, yeah. So one of the, one of the reasons is, <coughs> because people often seek refuge in high places. They seek refuge in high places. If there's a flood, if there's some kind of natural disaster, people are told to go to high ground. And we see an example of this in the Quran. In whose story? Nuh alayhi salam. Nuh The story of the son of Nuh. When the flood waters are coming, and he says to his father, Sa'awi ila jabani ya'simuni min al ma." I will go and seek refuge on the mountain. It will save me from the water. He says, لا عاصم اليوم من أمر الله إلا من رحم. No one will be saved on this day except those that Allah has mercy upon. فحال بينهم الموج وحال بينهم الموج فكان من المغرقين A wave came between them and he was from the drowned. So people associate high places with salvation, with safety, with refuge. And so Allah Azza wa will remove that from people. And usually the people who take high refuge and go to those places are the stronger, the more able, right? perhaps the wealthier. They are the ones who are given those types of places. And so another reason Allah Azza wa knows best why the mountains are also removed is so that there is no hierarchy on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. There is no difference in status that someone who considers themselves to be nobler, wealthier, more powerful, stronger. They say, no, we're going to stand higher up. Because when you stand higher up, right, when you raise someone on a platform, on a dais, they are raised up, they naturally are inclined to think that they are better than those beneath them, those who are lower. Right? And so that's a natural type of inclination. So Allah Azza wa removes mountains, that there is no place of refuge on that day, no one can escape from the terrors of Yawm Al-Qiyamah, and at the same time, there is no difference in station, in level, in hierarchy, in some people thinking that they are better than others. So Allah Azza wa Jal in this verse, He says, وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَلْعِهْنِ الْمَنْفُوشِ And the mountains are like tufts of wool. Ibn Atiyah, rahimahullah ta'ala, the scholar of tafsir, he said that the linguists, the scholars of Arabic language, they differed concerning the meaning of the word ihn. Ihn. Some of them said it refers to wool generally, any type of wool. Others said it refers to a red wool, red in color. And yet others said it refers to colored wool, irrespective of the color. So those are three opinions just from a linguistic standpoint, right? just from a linguistic viewpoint. It is either wool, it is red wool, or it is multicolored wool, it is wool. But it is wool. In Ihin is wool, and this is the opinion of the scholars of tafsir, as Qatada rahimahullah and others said. Al Imam al Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala in his commentary in his Sahih, he said, Al Ihin 
is colorful wool, wool of different colors. And the same was said by Imam Ibn Jarir al-Tabari, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, وَتَكُونُ الْجِبَالُ كَلْعِهْنِ الْمَنْفُوشِ Allah Azza wa Jal mentions that on that day, the mountains will become like wool that is scattered. And he said, الْعِهْن is different types of wool, and this is the position that we found amongst the scholars of tafsir, he said, rahimahullah ta'ala. Ibn Ashur said, the reason why they said, that it is different colored types of wool is what? Why did they say that it is different color? Why did Imam Bukhari, Al-Tabari, others go to that position of it being different colored types of wool? Could it be anything to do with the human race, uh, humans being different colors and symbolic of that? Similar, but obviously not humans, right? We're not talking about humans. Humans, humans were taken mountains. from different, sorry? Mountains. Because mountains are of different colors, right? Mountains, the rocks and the stones of mountains are of different colors. And so that's why they took that position. Ibn Ashur, rahimahullah, mentions this in his tafsir. He says, لِأَنَّ الْجِبَالَ مُخْتَلِفَةُ الْأَلْوَانِ بِحِجَارَتِهَا وَنَبَتِهَا Because mountains are of different colors in their stones, their rocks, and in what grows upon them in terms of plantation vegetation. And he mentions the verse of the Qur'an which Allah Azza wa Jal says, as a proof of this, وَمِنَ الْجِبَالِ جُدَدٌ بِيضٌ وَحُمْرٌ مُخْتَلِفٌ أَلْوَانُهَا Allah says that there are in the mountains layers of white and red of various hues, meaning of various shades. So you see pictures of mountains, some of them are black, some of them more brown, some of them more red, some of them more white. And so you have different colors within the mountains. And so that is why the scholars of Tafsir, alayhim rahmatullah, seem to go towards that position. They agree that it is wool, and then they added the different colors to it as well, because that seems to be the position. Muqatil. Rahimahullah, the scholar of tafsir, he has a, an interesting um, commentary on this verse. And he says that the mountains on that day, after their strength and their firmness, will become like scattered wool. He said that the people will see the mountains with their roots, their foundation, strong in the ground, with their peaks high up in the sky, and they will say it is a mountain. But when someone comes to touch it or place their hand on it, it will scatter into dust or it will scatter like wool right because it will remain in that shape and then it will move he says why he says from the severity of the qari'ah that crashing blow is what will make the mountain crumble into dust right? it will make it crumble from within into dust so that even though the form is there if you were to touch it it's actually nothing right it's actually nothing it will crumble into dust and so he says that that is how the mountain reacts to the qari'ah. So then what is the situation of humans? How will people be on that day? Right? And that's why the people that Yawm al-Qiyamah is established upon are the worst of creation, as is mentioned in the hadith. They will be the worst of people. Allah Azza wa will take away the lives of the believers before that. No believer will remain upon earth. The people upon whom Yawm al-Qiyamah is established, the hour is established, are considered to be the worst of Allah's creation. He says, but imagine, if that's the way that the mountain changes by the qari'ah, then imagine how a person who is far, far weaker, how they would react to that. Ibn Kathir, rahimahullah ta'ala, says that when it turns into scattered wool, or it turns into wool, it will begin to dissipate, it will begin to scatter, it will begin to float away, and it will begin, begin to come apart. And Imam al-Razi, he said that Allah Azza wa Jal makes in this surah a comparison between people and mountains. So when Allah Azza wa Jal chose in this surah to choose an example of humans and an example from his creation, he didn't choose the sun or the moon or the stars or the oceans, he chose mountains. He says, so Allah Azza wa Jal is making a comparison between the two. Because Allah Azza wa Jal wants us to understand the impact that the Qari'ah has on the mountains, and therefore we should think as to the impact that it will have on that day upon humans, and how no one on that day therefore can be saved except through Allah Azza wa Jal's mercy. So this is what the scholar said concerning the verse, verse number five: "What the kunul jibalu kalihni al-manfush." The mountains on that day will be like tufts of wool. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then carries on in 
verse number 6 and he says فَأَمَّا مَنْ فَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُ The one whose good deeds are heavy on the scales. The one whose good deeds are heavy on the scales. And often you find in the Quran that when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions verses concerning the day of judgment and its terrors and how things will change, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala afterwards would always give either a call to action or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will speak about the concept of reward and punishment. Because clearly Yawm Al-Qiyamah is the place of reward and punishment. And so therefore the reminder that we should work towards it, that we should, we should think about how we will stand on that day, our standing before Allah, our accounting before Him, which position we're in, always comes or often comes within that context. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will speak about Yawm Al-Qiyamah there will either be some call to action, some reminder of punishment or reward, or something similar in that regard. Like in this surah, where Allah Azza wa Jalla, after mentioning Al-Qari'ah, mentioning how people will be mentioning the mountains on that day, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't just finish the surah, because there is a call to action, there is something that we should ponder and reflect over. مَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُ So the one whose good deeds are heavy on that scale, on the scales. Amongst the scholars of tafsir, there are uh, two opinions. Number one is that the scales are literal. That's what's being referred to here. So when Allah Azza wa says, uh, the one whose good deeds are heavy on the scales, right? And even, um, you see the, so the translations we have, Abdul Halim, the one whose good deeds are heavy on the scales, Sahih International, then as for one whose scales are heavy, Mufti uh, Taqi Uthmani, then as for him whose scales are heavy, they're not all the same. There is a difference. What's the difference? One's literal and some are. <laughs> no, no, no. no. Don't just waffle, huh? Your scales being heavy with good deeds and your good deeds being heavy with the scales. No, so there's a difference between then as for one whose scales are heavy. Forget the, the parenthesis. Forget the parenthesis. Then as for one whose scales are heavy, then the one whose good deeds are heavy on the scales. Right? We're going to come on to this issue. It's a, it's a, it's a aqidah point. But that question is, what is weighed on Yawm Al-Qiyamah? Right? What is Allah referring to? What is weighed on the Day of Judgment? Is it the deed? Or is it the person? Or is it, for example, the record that, that's, that's been written? What is it that, that's, that's actually weighed? On Yom Al-Qiyam. But anyway, that, that was a, a slightly different point that I was referring to. Amongst the scholars that have seen the difference of opinion is whether it is actual scales, real scales, or whether it's referring to just the actions that are weighed, not necessarily on a scale. They are weighed by Allah Azza wa but not on a scale. Right? And so in Mujahid, Rahimallah Ta'ala said, Laysa mizan. It's not an actual scale. Rather, it is an example that is given in the Quran. Right? That was the position of some of the early scholars of tafsir. The position of Ahlul Sunnah generally, of Jama'a Ahlul Sunnah, and the position that they have, uh, that they have, is that it is an actual scale that Allah Azza wa Jalla will bring on that day. And there are many uh, proofs for this that we will mention from the Quran and from the Sunnah. Al Imam Al Tabari, rahimahullah Taala, said, "فَأَمَّا مَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُ حَسَنَاتِهِ." As for the one whose good deeds are heavy on the scales, and he said, "What is meant by the mawazin is what is." Measured, right? What is measured, what is weighed, that is what is being referred to. Ibn Atiyah, rahimahullah ta'ala said, it is the mawazin, the scales that Allah Azza wa Jal will set on the day of judgment. And the majority of the scholars of hadith and fiqh and generally said that the mizan, the scales of Yawm Al-Qiyamah will have a, a pillar and will have two plates, right? Two sides to it. So it will have, as we normally see a scale, it will have the, the fulcrum, right, the, 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 the weight part, and then the two, the two in Arabic is called kiffa, right, which means kiffa is like hands or plates or, you know, the two sides of the scales. So that Allah Azza wa Jal may, uh, and obviously Ibn Atiyah is, is, a, is a scholar who comes much later than Ibn, uh, Ibn Jadr al-Tabari and Mujahid and others. In Adwa'ul Bayan, uh, Shaykh Muhammad al-Amin rahimahullah says, wal mawazin the word mizan can refer to two things. It can refer to the actual implement, the instrument that you use to weigh something, or it can refer to what is being weighed. 
So it can refer to the actual instrument that is used as a measuring scale. It is a name for that, the scales. Or it is also used in Arabic language to mean what is actually being weighed. The thing that is actually being weighed, which is obviously the actions and the deeds that are being weighed. And this brings us on to this issue of the Mizan, the scales on the Day of Judgment. And the position of Ahlul Sunnah is that it is a real scale. That these are real scales that Allah Azza wa will use to weigh the deeds of people. Not because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't know, or that Allah Azza wa is unable to know, or doesn't know, or can't determine what is heavy or light in the scales, but as a means of establishing proof upon people that they see before their very eyes the weight of their deeds, whether good or bad. And that's why Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah ta'ala, narrates from some of the scholars, they said that it is the ijma' of Ahlul Sunnah by consensus that from Iman is to believe in the scales on the Day of Judgment. And Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala was asked about the mizan, the scales. He said that it will have two sides, meaning two plates, and it has a tongue by which it will speak. It has a tongue by which it speaks, and it has two sides. Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah ta'ala said, and this shows, and the general proofs of the Quran and Sunnah show, that the mizan, the scales are different to Allah's justice. Allah is just. But Allah's justice is not the same as his scales. The scales are something that will be set and that people will see on that day and they will be used to measure people and their, and their deeds. As Allah Azza wa mentions in this verse, فَمَنْ ثَقْوَلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ أَمَّا مَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُ And as Allah Azza wa says in Surah Al-Anbiya, وَنَضَعُ الْمَوَازِينَ الْقِسْطَ لِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ and he will place the scales of justice on the day of judgment. And due to the hadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in al-Bukhari and Muslim, the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu an, kalimatani khafifatani ala al-lisan. Two statements are light upon the tongue. Thaqilatani fil mizan. Heavy upon the scale. Habibatani ila al-Rahman. Beloved to Allah. To say subhanallah wa bihamdih. Subhanallah al-Azim. And due to the hadith of Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu an, uh, when the Prophet said Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam concerning his leg that indeed it is heavier than the mountain of Uhud. Right? It is heavier in the scales than the mountain of Uhud and due to the hadith of Bataqa, the card of La ilaha illallah which we will mention in more detail. So the proofs of the Mizan in the Quran or the verses that speak about the Mizan in the Quran are number one, the verse in Surah Al-A'raf verses eight and nine when Allah Azza wa says, وَالْوَزْنُ يَوْمَ إِذِنِ الْحَقِّ And the weighing on that day will be true. فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمُ الْمُفْلِحُونَ So whosoever scales are heavy, then they will be from the successful. وَمَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ And whoever scales are light, فَأُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ Then they are those who have lost themselves. بِمَا كَانُوا بِآيَاتِنَا يَظْلِمُونَ Due to the oppression or due to the rejection of our signs and our verses. And similarly in Surah Al-Anbiya, verse number 47, Allah Azza wa Jal says, وَنَضَعُ الْمَوَازِينَ الْقِسْطَ لِيَوْمِ الْقِيَامَةِ And we will place the scales of justice on the day of judgment. فَلَا تُظْلَمُ نَفْسٌ شَيْئًا So no soul will be oppressed in any way. وَإِنْ كَانَ مِثْقَالَ حَبَّةٍ مِّنْ خَرْدَلٍ أَتَيْنَا بِهَا And even if it is the weight of a mustard seed, we will bring it and it will be held to account. Similarly, in Surah Al-Mu'minun, verses 102-103, Allah Azza wa Jal says, فَمَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُهُ فَأُولَٰئِكَ هُمْ الْمُفْلِحُونَ Whosoever scales are heavy, then they will be from the successful. وَمَنْ خَفَّتْ مَوَازِينُهُ And whosoever scales are light, فَأُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ خَسِرُوا أَنفُسَهُمْ فِي جَهَنَّمَ خَالِدُونَ Then there are those who have lost themselves, they will be forever in the hellfire. Similarly, we have the verses here in Surah Al-Qari'ah, which we don't need to go through. But in Surah Al-Kahf, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, verse 105, أُولَٰئِكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا بِآيَاتِ رَبِّهِمْ وَلِقَائِهِ They are those who disbelieved in the signs of their Lord and in His meeting. فَحَبِطَتْ أَعْمَالُهُمْ So their actions were rendered null and void. فَلَا نُقِيمُ لَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَزْنًا So we will attach to them no weight on the day of judgment. And in the Sunnah, we have the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, the hadith that we mentioned 
in Al-Bukhari and Muslim of the two statements, Subhanallah wa bihamdi, Subhanallah al azim We also have the hadith that is uh, of Abu Malik al-Ash'ari, radiyallahu anhu, that the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, at-tahuru shatru al-iman, purification is half of iman, walhamdulillahi tamla'u al-mizan, and to say alhamdulillah fills the scales, wa subhanallah walhamdulillahi tamla'u ma bayna al-samawati wal-ard, and to say, subhanallah and alhamdulillah, they fill what is between the heavens and the earth. And the prayer is light, and a sadaqah charity is a clear proof, and a sabr patience is illumination, and the Qur'an will either be a proof for you, or a proof against you. Similarly, in the hadith of a tirmidhi, of a man from Bani Sulaim, who said that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam counted on my hand, or upon his hand, and he said, At-Tasbih, to say subhanallah, nisful mizan is half of the scales. Walhamd, and to praise Allah, to say alhamdulillah, fills the scales. Wal-Takbir, to say the takbir, Allahu Akbar, fills what is between the heavens and the earth. And fasting, half of it is patience. And purification, half of it is iman or faith. Similarly, the hadith of Abdullah ibn Amr, radiyallahu anhumah, the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there are two characteristics and attributes that most Muslims do not consider will enter them. There are two, two attributes that a person does not consider that will enter them into Jannah. They are simple and easy to do, but those who perform them are very few. That you say after every salah to make the tasbih ten times and to make the Tahmeed, say Alhamdulillah 10 times, and to say Allahu Akbar 10 times, right? And as we know from the adhkar of the salah, when we make the dhikr on the tasbih, subhanallah, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, we have how many different forms is it narrated in the sunnah? Ten. Seven. 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 No. Four different ways that is mentioned in the sunnah of making tasbih after salah. Right, four different narrations. The first is? 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 33, 34. So to say 33, subhanallah, 33, alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, 34. The second form is? 33, 33, 33, 33. To say 33, subhanallah, 33, alhamdulillah, 33, Allahu Akbar, and then to finish it with? La ilaha illallah, wahdahu la sharika la. The third way is? 10, 10, 10. What is mentioned in this hadith, to say 10 times. Subhanallah, 10, alhamdulillah, 10. Allahu Akbar, 10. And the fourth way is to say each one uh, 25 times. Right? And so you find them within the Sunnah. So, and obviously, therefore, what is the Sunnah? The Sunnah is to do all of this. Right? To change between them. Because when you have authentic hadith and there are slight differences between them, it shows that the Prophet used to do all of them from time to time. And so therefore, from the Sunnah is to revive the Sunnah and to do this sometimes and to do that sometimes. So for example, if you're pressed for time and you don't have much time, you're at work, you're, I don't know, whatever, traveling, whatever it may be in an airport, and you don't have much time, you don't have to do the whole 33, 33, do it 10 times. Right? 10 times, 10 times, 10 times, and you're done. Right? And so that is also from the fiqh and understanding of how to make adhkar and how to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the point being here, the Prophet ﷺ said, for a person to say subhanallah 10 times, alhamdulillah 10 times, Allahu Akbar 10 times. And then he said, I saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam count upon my hand. And he said, to do that is to say it, if you do it after every prayer, 150 times by the tongue. Right, 30 times times 550 for the day, but 1,500 in the scales. And then before you go to sleep, say, Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Allahu Akbar, a hundred times. That is a hundred on the tongue, but a thousand upon the scales. So who from amongst you can perform 2,500 good deeds? And who from amongst you commits 2,500 sins? Right? So then the, the narrator, he asks, I said, O Messenger of Allah, how come people don't do this? How come people don't consider this as a means of entering into Jannah? He said, because shaitan comes to a person in the salah and he says to them, remember this and remember that. So when they finish, they leave. 
before making the adhkar. Right? They leave before making the adhkar. And that's something very common today, which you will find very rare amongst previous generations that a person, person would finish their salah and be out. That they would make the salam sometimes even before the imam has turned around. Right? The imam hasn't even like finished and turned around and they're already out the door. You see it on Jumu'ah, you see it like, even in normal prayers. It's very common. It's not something that you find in the early generations of Muslims. A person comes and he busies them. And so a person, what happens? Shaitan comes, busies a person and they leave without making their adhkar. And he comes to a person at night and he continues to tell them that they're tired and go to sleep until they fall asleep without making their adhkar. And this hadith is in At-Tirmidhi and in nisai Two questions, Shaykh. Uh, in the night, is it 100 each or 100 in total? So no, it's 100 in total. So 30, 30, 30, 30. Yeah. And then the second question was, after Salah, is it when you sit down, can you stand and say, move away for a bit and do it as you're walking? Or is it you have to remain seated and do it? So the general, like Sunnah of the Prophet after Salah, is that he will make his adhkar seated. But obviously if someone has to leave, like you have to get back to work or whatever, you can make adhkar whilst you're, whilst you're walking and whilst you're moving. But generally if you're not in a rush and so on, the sunnah is that you sit down, right? Because the adhkar are not just the tasbih. Right? You have du'as before it, you have reciting ayat al-kursi, the last three surahs of the Qur'an. So you have different adhkar that you should make. And that's also from you know, the, the part of, of salah that, that, that helps you to, uh, you know, to have khushu' in salah. Okay, so there is a difference of opinion amongst the scholars as to how to count on the fingers. Um, uh, because the Prophet is not mentioned, as far as I know, in a, in a hadith exactly how he used to count. And so you find different methodologies. Whichever of those that you do, though, is, is fine. Yeah. What, what did you say about, because I've read that the hadith that says not to use the left hand is weak. So therefore some scholars say to also use the left hand. In making adhkar? Yeah. Yeah, so that's the position amongst the scholars that you make adhkar using both hands. Another said, no, you just use the right hand. And, and like I said, there's no like clear hadith in this. So I think e- either one or any of those is fine. In another hadith, also in a Tirmidhi and Imam Ahmad, in the Muslim Imam Ahmad, the hadith of Abu Darda, radiyallahu an. Do we have any questions online? Uh, the hadith of Abu Darda, radiyallahu an. The Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there will be nothing heavier on the scales for the believer on the day of judgment than good character. Good character. And also in the Sunan of Abi Dawood, although this hadith uh, has weakness in it, the hadith of Aisha radiallahu anha, that uh, how far was mentioned to her, so she began to cry. So the Prophet said to her, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, why do you cry? She said, I remember the fire, so I cried. Will a person remember their family on that day, O Messenger of Allah? The Prophet ﷺ said there will be three times, three places, where no one will remember anyone else. No person will remember any other person. When the scales are placed, until a person knows whether their scales will be heavy or light, when their record of deeds is given and they're told to take it, until they know whether their record is given to them in their right hand or their left hand or behind their back, and when the bridge is placed upon the fire of hell. And as I said, the hadith has some weakness in it, as mentioned by Ibn Hajar rahimahullah ta'ala. So the question that we had when we were looking at the translation is, what is it that's actually weighed? Right? So according to, because Allah Azza wa doesn't say the deeds are weighed. He says, فَمَنْ ثَقْ فَأَمَّا مَنْ ثَقُلَتْ مَوَازِينُ Whoever, their scales are heavy. Their scales are heavy. The good deeds that you find in the translation, whether in parenthesis or otherwise, is the addition of a translator. They have added that. And so amongst the scholars of Aqeedah, you find, or generally the Muslim scholars, you find three positions. Right? Three positions, or maybe even four, concerning what it is that is weighed on the scales on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. The first of them is that it is the actions themselves. The actions themselves, right? And this is the opinion that was supported by Ibn Hajar, rahimahullah ta'ala. And they based that upon a number of hadith. From them is the hadith that we mentioned of Subhanallah wa bihamdi, Subhanallah al-Azim, right? Two statements, beloved to Allah, light upon the tongue, heavy upon the scales. Which seems to indicate what? That it is actual deed and action 
the statement itself that is weighed. Similarly, in the hadith of uh, the Prophet ﷺ, the hadith of Abu Umama radiallahu an in Sahih Muslim, when the Prophet ﷺ said, read the Quran for it will come as an intercessor for its people on the day of judgment. Read Surah Baqarah and Ali Imran for they will come on the day of judgment as clouds or as a flock of birds and they will give shade on the day of judgment. How is that a proof for what he's mentioning? It doesn't mention the scales. The Quran, Surah Al-Baqarah, Surah Al-Imran. Why does he bring that here? What's he trying to show? He's trying to show that deeds on the day of judgment will take a form. They will take form, right? So that's the whole thing that Allah Azza wa weighs the deeds, right? So the deeds themselves, they take form, right? And similarly, the hadith that we mentioned of Abu Darda radiallahu an, nothing will be heavy on the day of judgment, then good character, right? That's the first position. What's being weighed? The actions, the deeds themselves. The second position amongst the scholars is that it is the person that is weighed. The person will be weighed. And they use as a proof for this the hadith in Al-Bukhari, the hadith of Abu Huraira, radiallahu an, that the Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, a person who is obese and fat will come on the day of judgment but will not weigh in the sight of Allah the wing of a mosquito. And then he said, and read if you wish the verse of the Quran that we mentioned before, فَلَا نُقِيمُ لَهُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ وَزْنَا In Surah Al-Kahf, we will attach to them no weight. And a person will come on the day of judgment who is thin and whose legs are thin and they will come and they will weigh more than a mountain. Right? And similar to that is the hadith of, as we mentioned, Abdullah bin Mas'ud radiallahu anhu and some of the companions laughed at how thin his legs were. They were bony, right? literally very, very thin. And so the Prophet said, do you laugh at the leg of Abdullah bin Mas'ud by Allah? In the sight of Allah, it is heavier in the scales than the mountain of Uhud. Right? And so they say, based upon these ahadith, what is being weighed on the day of judgment is the person themselves. So the first opinion was actions. The second opinion is the person. The third opinion is that it is the record of deeds. The record of deeds. And they use as proof for this hadith in the Tirmidhi of Abdullah ibn Amr ibn Ras radiallahu anhuma what is famously known as the hadith of the bataqa that a person will come on the day of judgment with 99 scrolls of evil deeds each scroll when it is open will go as far as the horizon as far as the eye can see so Allah Azza wa will say to this man on the day of judgment do you deny any of this have you been oppressed by the angels that record your deeds and he will say no O oh Allah so Allah will say do you have any excuse and he will say no O oh Allah so he will say, oh, well, so Allah Azza wa will ask him, what good deeds do you have to present? The man will say, I have nothing, O oh Allah. The Prophet Allah Azza wa will say to that man on the day of judgment, rather you have one good deed, and today you will not be oppressed, so a card will be brought out. And that's why it's known as the hadith of bataqa, which means card, the hadith of the card. Right? That's what the scholars refer to this hadith as, because a card will be brought out, bataqa, I mean, this we translate it as card, but it's like yani, a parchment will be brought out upon which you will say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. And so Allah will say, weigh this card or weigh this parchment in relation to the 99 scrolls. The man will say, oh Allah, and what good will this card do in relation to these 99 scrolls? So Allah will say, today you will not be oppressed. So the card will be placed on one side of the scale the scrolls on the other side. Right? And that's why this hadith we use as a proof of those scholars who say that it's an actual scale. Because this hadith says that they will be weighed in that manner. And then the hadith says, فَطَاشَتْ السِّجِلَّاتِ The scrolls will fly into the air. Meaning that the card will be so heavy that they will fly into the air. And the card will be heavier. For verily there is nothing heavier in the scales than the name of Allah. There is nothing heavier in the scales than the name of Allah Azza wa Jalla. And this was the position that some of the scholars like Imam Al-Qurtubi, Ibn Abdul Bar, rahmatullah, and others kind of veered towards this position, that it is the record of deeds, and there is a, you know, a very slight difference right, between the record of deeds and the actions and the person being uh, weighed. Right? Obviously all of them essentially amount to the same thing, whether it's this or that that's being weighed, 
The record is the record that's being weighed. The action is action itself. The person is the person. And the strongest opinion is the fourth opinion. And that is that all three are weighed. Because we have a hadith that established all of them. Actions, people, and records of deeds. And so the strongest opinion amongst, therefore, the scholars of Islam as Al-Hafid al-Hakami, rahimahullah ta'ala, mentioned in his work, is that the strongest position, therefore, is that all of this is weighed. So on Yawm Al-Qiyamah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will weigh people and he will weigh their actions and he will weigh their record of deeds. And that's how we combine between the verses of the Qur'an and all of these ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will sometimes weigh a person, sometimes their deeds, and sometimes he will weigh their record of deeds. Any questions? So, the uh, question is that brother heard someone say that on Yom Al Qiyamah in the scales, the heavier the scale is, it goes up, like in reverse to what we would consider it to be. Yeah, it's elevated. I don't, I don't know, uh, but the hadith of the Bataqa seems to indicate otherwise. Right, um, that, that it's the lighter side that goes up, as you would normally consider to be a scale. Right, if it goes the other way around, then how does that? How does that work? You mean just because it's good deeds, so they're higher up? Yeah, that doesn't sound like a scholarly um, position to me. I don't know. Allah yeah. Adam, I've never come across that before. So you know, the scale and the way you know, does that also apply to the non-Muslims as well? Does the scale apply to uh, the non-Muslims as well? Because they don't believe. Yeah, they don't believe. So, uh, no. As far as I know, it doesn't refer to the disbelievers. Because they have nothing to weigh except evil deeds. Um, all Muslims have to go through the process of the scales and weighing, or was it the 70,000 that the Jamal Yes, yeah, so the hadith of the 70,000 refers to them not having any accounting and not having any punishment. So whether they have to go through this just as a as a process for not being held to account, Allah alam, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, can you mention the, the different types of uh, dhikr that would be done? Could one not say that 33, 33, 33 without the addition of another form of dhikr is a different type to um, 33, 33, 33 and then adding the uh, What do you mean? I mean you said because there's a hadith where you recite 33. 33, 33, 34. And you said you can recite 10, 10, 10. You yeah. can 25, 25, 25. Yeah. And you said 33, 33, 33. Then you add the extra line. Yeah. Right? Could one also say that another form would be 33, 33, 33, and just stop there based on the hadith? So the hadith, so the adhkar that we're speaking about after salah are the hadith that speak about the adhkar after salah. Like this hadith that we mentioned after the 10, right? It actually says that this is after salah. Right. So obviously you have other hadith right, that also, like for example, this hadith also mentions making this tasbih uh, and so on before sleep. Right. And similarly, the hadith, the hadith of Ali and Fatima radiallahu anhuma, when the Prophet told them to do something similar, right? he said to them 33, 33, and 34 in the hadith of Ali and Fatima. But that's for sleep. Right. And so you have a distinction in the hadith between the adhkar that you make after salah and the adhkar that you make before sleep, even though, obviously, as we know, before sleep, you also do ayat al-kursi, you can do the three last surahs of the Qur'an, and so on. There is a, obviously, repetition between the two. Anyone else? Bilal? Mm-hmm. As far as I remember now. So, so other than the 70,000 who will enter Jannah without account, everybody else who enters Jannah will face the Mizan, correct? Yeah. Is it not the case that there are non Muslims who also will event some? Non Muslim, sorry, that? Will, will there be some non Muslims who will, but will Allah enter Jannah to some? No. 
Surely you've got to believe in Allah too. No. There are no non Muslims that enter into Jannah. No non Muslims that enter into Jannah. The, the basic requirement of entering into Jannah is Iman. To say, Rayah in Allah. So Allah says in the Quran, Allah won't forgive shirk. And He forgives everything else besides it, to whomsoever He wills. They're all believers. So any hadith that says, for example, someone son did a major sin and then they did something and Allah forgave them and they entered into Jannah. Like this hadith of the Bataqa, 99 scrolls of evil deeds, but then he has one good deed. All of them have Iman. All of them have what Iman. What about the people who the message of Islam didn't reach? Because That's a like different Iman, issue. That's a different issue. So the issue of people who, for example, didn't hear of the message, they came between what they call Ahlul Fatra, between two different prophets. Most of the scholars of the position that they will have their own test on Yom al Qiyamah. Allah will test them on the Day of Judgment and those people who pass that test of Iman will enter into Jannah and those who don't will go into the fire. And likewise the one for example who in this world didn't have their, their mental faculties about them. Someone who's deaf, dumb and blind had no way of understanding and receiving the message. All of those people are in a separate category. They will have their own test on Yom Al-Qiyamah and then depending on that they enter or they don't. For those people? As far as I know there is um, I know that there's a debate amongst the scholars concerning children of non-Muslims. So they will not even going to Jannah. There's another, is an, if we're going to go into position, is there not another position that so even some of the kids won't enter Jannah? Because That's what I'm saying. Really There's that debate that I'm aware of amongst children, right? And, and, and how that works with children. But in terms of adults, Allah, I don't know. If there's a position in, in, in amongst classical scholars that say that they just enter into Jannah without any type of form of, of accounting or any type of test, that just because they came at a time when there was nothing there that they automatically entered into Jannah. Is it, Allah, there Allah, 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 Allah. 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 Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's, 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 there's narrations or... Yeah, but the, then you can make Qiyas of the same, right? Because these people didn't receive the message also, in a different way. So the people who don't receive a message because the Prophet doesn't come, and the people who don't receive a message because of some disability or because of some... All the same, essentially, both don't receive the message, just for different reasons. And Allah knows best. And that the pen is lifted. Yeah. Sorry? The hadith is mentioned upon the mentally level, not upon the one yeah. Yeah. between two. Yeah. Anyone else? Oh, is there a coronavirus on it? Is there? Um, would you happen to have the reference for the narration saying to the Adhkar 25 yeah, times after each salah? Sahih Muslim? Yeah. 59, so hadith 595. I, I, read the hadith, read the hadith. You have the hadith? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, read it. That's what I'm Yeah, read it. For memory. Will be snatched or will be snatched? Just so, read the hadith. I'll read the Quran actually. So, 594. Hadith in Sahih Muslim, 594. Five, no, no. It starts with 595. Uh, 595. Just for, for the online one. 595, uh, 33, 33, 33. <coughs> 596, 33, 33, 34. 597 is the one I was asking about. 33, 33, 33, and then the one added on to make it 100. Yeah. There are two separate hadith. Uh, then you've got 10, 10, 10, yeah. which is in uh, Sahih Bukhari, 6,329. Yeah. Uh, then you've got 25, 25, 25, which is in uh, Imam Nasa'i, 1351. Okay, Ror, she's just asking about the 25 one when you. Right, you sorry. So, yeah, I'll read, I'll read it out to you. That's in Nasa'i. No, no, uh, yeah, yeah, that's in the same. Okay, so the hadith that says 25, 25, 25, is it? So, do you have the hadith? The actual hadith itself? I find it. No, no, it's okay, all right. No, Jazakallah khair. So, it's in Surah Nasai. I thought you actually had the hadith. Okay, what is the opinion of using a tisbih, the ones you find in some mosques hanging? <laughs> it depends if you've got one here. Yeah, have <laughs> yeah, you got one? Uh, some scholars don't like it, they dislike it because they say that it's not something which. You'll find amongst the early scholars any narration from the Prophet, some of the companions, the early scholars. Other scholars said, if, look, if someone needs it, someone's old, someone has problems counting, someone finds it difficult to keep track, 
uh, you know, Shaykh Nathaymi, rahmahullah, for example, has that position, then it's okay. As long as they don't believe that it's part of the sunnah. That's not a, something that's from Islam. It's not part of the sunnah. You don't get extra reward by using it. It's just like a counter, right? It's just something that you're using simply to count, right? It has no significance in our religion. It has no uh, religious um, position, no extra reward, anything attached to it, then it's okay. And Allah Azza wa Jal knows best. Shaykh, you want to hear the hadithan? You got it? Yeah. That's good. So, uh, See, Google, that's what happens when Google. Uh, they were commanded to say the Tasbih 33 times following the prayer and to say the Hamid 33 times and to say the Takbir 34 times. Then a man from among the Ansar was told in a dream, did the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam command you to say the Tasbih 33 times following the prayer and to say the Hamid 33 times and to say the Takbir 34 times? He said, yes, instead of that, say each one 25 times and include the Halil among them. The next morning he came to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and told him about that. And the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, do that. Yeah. So the hadith is in Surah Nisai, the hadith of Zayd ibn Thabit. Radiyallahu anhu. Barakallahu fiqh. Okay, so inshallah, I think we'll, we'll pause there for today. Jazakumullah khairan. And next week, what time are we? 8.05. 8.05? 8.05. 8.05. So I think Salah is at 40 to 8. 8.05. Yeah, 8.05, we start the class, and Isha is 7.45. So, inshallah, next week, 5 past 8, inshallah. Barakallahu feekum, Musa'an bin Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sallam. For the, that's not for the Muslim children. Okay. Muslim children go straight into Jannah. The Hadith of Prophet saw the children of the believers under the guardianship of Ibrahim alayhi salam when he went to the night Jannah. Right. Okay, because I think um, Sheikh um, Bilal Phillips um, uh, said something like, um, I think he was referring to the Muslim children as well. I mean, before they die, uh, before uh, when they die, before they get puberty. So I thought it applies to all children.